these air pollution monitoring stations that are set up uh, all around the place. What this means, of course, is that for many individuals, the exposure that we infer that they have, the exposure that we assign to them in any study of the relationship between exposure and disease, pollutant exposure and disease, is not actually accurate. It's in error. There is, it's a misassignment. And uh, the extent to which that happens makes it much more difficult to see whether there is a real association between the exposure and the disease. So if you misclassify or classify people incorrectly, it's much more difficult to find associations even when real associations exist. So just to finish that point, that, so that the more accurate and the less, the more accurate you is the measurement for individuals of the pollution exposure, the more power you have, the more likely it is you're, like, you're going to be able to see uh, actual associations with health effects. So, I've talked about pollutants and how you measure them. Now let's talk about the disease. So, what is it that we should be measuring? We've heard already this morning from Jeff a whole lot of different things. If you remember his pyramid, which had a mortality at the top and had a number of lung function measures and biochemical measures at the, at the bottom. Well, what, what, we, what I'm interested in is what we all want, and that is living a long, healthy life. And ultimately, the, uh, the objective of um, reducing, of improving exposures or improving our environment is to reduce the extent to which the environment causes us to either have a shorter life, to die earlier than we otherwise would, or it causes us to have disability or to impair our quality of life, or it causes us to have a more prolonged or a disability or impaired quality of life. So we want to live as long and healthy life as we can, and we want to avoid exposures which prevent that from happening. Um, Jeff has already shown you this, this is, or something like this. This is a slide I borrowed from Professor Bert Bunkrieff, who will be here tomorrow, um, about the issue about deaths. <laughs> and uh, the deaths, uh, although lots of people, in fact, are successful in avoiding taxes, I'm not, I don't know anybody who's going to be successful in avoiding death. It, it is an inevitable thing and nothing I can do to prevent, to reduce your exposures will prevent you from dying. But what we might be able to do is uh, prevent you from dying earlier than you otherwise would have. And that's essentially, we can't cause or avoid deaths, all we can do is stop, we can prevent them from being brought forward, or in other words, postpone time, as he says, is the essence. So sometimes, though, it's not possible in epidemiological studies or in, in real life to actually investigate quality of life, or particularly deaths, directly. There are not that many deaths, fortunately, in any given population. And if you only are studying a smallish population, it's not going to be feasible to wait for people to die to tell whether or not uh, the air pollution exposure has contributed towards that. So what we do essentially is measure things that I view as surrogates for, or, or as intermediate outcomes towards that. So we're interested in symptoms because symptoms impair quality of life, they make you feel worse, so they're associated with disability. Hospitalizations and the, the presence of illness are also a surrogate for um, risk of death and for impaired quality of life. And then further down here you have things that on their own don't cause a person a problem. People don't, come, don't complain that my heart isn't working very well. They only complain that it is causing them symptoms. And they don't complain if they have impaired biochemical or cellular function. They only complain of it if it's causing them symptoms. But we, can, we know something about the relationship between function of the heart and the lungs and biochemistry and cellular tests. We know something about the relationship between those things and the um, and the likelihood of developing disease, developing impaired quality of life, or dying prematurely. And it's because of that known surrogate relationship that we can measure these biomarkers, sometimes they're called biomarkers, markers of risk. But it is important to note that they are only markers of risk. They're not the endpoint that really matters in itself. The endpoint that really matters is 
is this going to shorten my life or is it going to make me feel unwell or disabled? So that's what really matters. And sometimes some of the markers that are used in health studies are really quite speculative for their relationship between important health outcomes. So sometimes you'll see studies that report rather exotic uh, outcomes of biochemistry or immunology or other, other things like that. And these, those, sometimes those things have no known relationship to actually important health outcomes. So it's important to ask yourself those questions when you see uh, some of the health studies. So the question is, is the ex so the questions we want to ask about air pollution and health When we ask ourselves about air pollution exposures and disease, is whether there's a, whether the air pollution exposure is causing the disease or the adverse health outcome. First of all, are the two associated? And secondly, is the outcome causal? Is the association causal? So in order to demonstrate if there's an association between an exposure and a disease, we first of all need to show that within any given population there is some variation in exposure. So if everybody in the population is exposed to the same thing, then we're never going to see that that exposure is associated with anything else. And that is in fact one of the problems up in the Upper Hunter Valley. If everybody is exposed to the same environment, then we can't show just by looking at the Upper Hunter Valley that that, that that exposure is causing any harm. We need to see some variation in the exposure and we need to be able to compare the exposed versus the not exposed. So for example, we might want to compare people who live in Musselbrook with people who live elsewhere, or people who have a wood heater with people who don't have a wood heater, or a person who works in a mine with a person who doesn't work in a mine. It's those comparisons between exposed and unexposed that allow us to tell us whether this exposure is causing any harm. If everybody is exposed, then we can't tell. It was said, one of the, when smoking was first found to be associated with, um, with um, uh, lung cancer, the famous epidemiologist who found that pointed out that if everybody smoked, and in the 1950s nearly everybody did smoke, but if everybody smoked, then smoking would appear to be a genetic disease because the only people who would get it would be those who were susceptible to it. The only way you can tell that smoking causes lung cancer is by finding people who don't smoke and, who, and demonstrating that they don't get lung cancer. So it's the same with this. You need to compare people with the exposure and people without the exposure. Uh, sometimes it's not as simple as exposed and not exposed. Sometimes you just have a range of exposures. And this is the case in, in relation to pollutant exposures. You see people who are exposed to low levels of pollution and others who are exposed to high levels of pollution. So I've got a couple of just hypothetical examples here just to demonstrate. So this is just, this is a population in, of, uh, of 100 people here who are exposed to something and 2,000 people who are not exposed to something, X, whatever it is. And amongst those who are exposed, those 100 people who are exposed, 20 of them have disease. That is 20%. 20 out of 100 have disease. Amongst those who are not exposed, the 2,400 have disease. That's 400 out of 2,000, which is also 20%. So you can see that in both the exposed population and the unexposed population, the number of the risk of having disease is the same, 20%. So in this case, we see that there's no association between the exposure and the disease. On the other hand, this is another hypothetical example. Again, 100 people exposed to the thing that we're interested in and 2,000 not exposed. In this case, 40 of them have the disease, 40%. And 400 of them still, who are not exposed, have the disease, 25%. So in this case, we can see that the exposure is associated with the disease because those who are exposed have a higher risk or prevalence of disease than those who are not exposed, 40% as opposed to 25%. So that's one example. Now, what about if there's a continuous variable? This is a, a relationship between some exposure, say a pollutant, say 
whatever the pollutant is, and some health outcome, say lung function or heart function or something like that that's measured on a continuous scale. Here you can see that the, the and each, this, each dot on this plot represents one person in whom we're showing on this axis what their exposure is and on this axis what their outcome is. And on this plot you can see that they're completely scattered. There's no relationship between the exposure and the outcome. That becomes clearer when I show you the next plot, which is a situation where there is a relationship between the exposure and the outcome. Um, here you can see that as those people who have higher levels of exposure also have higher levels on the outcome, some, um, some scale. And then those who have low levels of exposure have low levels on the outcome. So here you can see that there is a relationship and it can actually fit a line through these which describes that average relationship. Not everybody sits perfectly on that line but they're scattered around that line. So you can see the difference between this one when those who have low levels of exposure are just as likely to have high or low levels of the outcome and those who have high levels of the exposure are just as likely to have high or low levels. No relationship and here a strong relationship. So that's how we tell if there is an association. Is there an association present between the exposure and the uh, outcome? But just because it's an association doesn't necessarily mean that it's causal. Um, and, and one, before I go on, one reason that it might not be causal is that we, we don't know which, which direction the relationship, although I call this exposure and outcome, if this is a pollutant and this is a health outcome, there is only one direction in which it would go. But what if I said this was educational status and this was income or wealth? Okay, and we, perhaps we show that people who have higher educational status have higher wealth. Does that mean necessarily that having higher education causes you to have better, be wealthier? Or could it mean the other way around, that people who are wealthier get better education? We don't know which is, which is the chicken and which is the egg. Okay, what's the cause and what's the effect? Some cases it's obvious, but some cases it's not. But the other problems that we have is there's the problem of chance or certainty, um, and confounding and bias, and then timing and temporal sequence. I'm going to talk a bit about chance and certainty and about confounding and bias because they're critical to understanding how we interpret whether an observed relationship is actually a true causal relationship. Does the exposure actually cause the disease? Now I'm going to try and do something fancy with my computer and it may not work. But this is just an example. I don't know how well you can see this from the back, probably not very well. But this is just again another hypothetical example. Here is a, th a population, if you like, of a thousand dots. And I think uh, 20 out of those thousand dots are red. Can anybody uh, see the red dots? Okay, all right. 20 out of a thousand of those dots are red. Now, I'm going to take a sample of a hundred of that. I've randomly selected a hundred of those 2,000 dots. Now it's ready to do something fancy. Um, Sample it again, 
will come up as five. Uh, in other words, every time I take a sample, the prevalence of them might vary between zero and five percent. Most of them will be centered around two, but a lot of them will be less than that. And if I take small samples, like a hundred out of this population, I have a good chance of finding the wrong answer. The right answer is 2% because I know that in the whole population there is 2% but if I take small samples I have a good chance of getting the wrong answer of just getting, uh, of not getting 2%. If on the other hand I take a sample of 500 um, then 500 uh, I should get um, uh, a prevalence of 2% and I, when, you, when I keep taking samples of 500, much larger samples, although they won't all be exactly 2%, they will be much closer to 2%. They may be 1.8%, they may be 1.9%, 2%, 2.1%, 2.2%. So they'll be much closer to 2%. The whole